Hello guys, Willem Pets here. Sorry for that little hang-up that we had right there. Um, some technical issues. I just want to apologize in advance. Uh, this is going to be an excellent stream, but I'm not as well-dressed as I usually am, as you can see. And uh, as you can probably hear, I'm already a little bit sick. So, um, by the way, the guys who are here, can you guys quickly please go tell the other guys on the other stream to come onto this link? Because, yeah, the other stream is not the one that we're going to use because of technical issues with the link so um that's that but any case thank you very much for tuning in as you guys know i have these live shows every monday wednesday and friday at 6 p.m and uh, so be sure to tune in all the time at this time because these interviews are always very good also, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet and you enjoy the content that we make here, be sure to subscribe. And after you click on the subscribe, click on that bell icon so that you will receive notifications. Otherwise, you won't receive the notifications for the videos when they come out. Also, if you want to receive the updates on Telegram, you're welcome to join our channels there. Uh, for the English channel on Telegram, it's t.me forward slash Willem Petzer, as you can see on the screen. And for the Afrikaans channel, it's t.me forward slash Willem Petzer A. All right, so um, please go tell the other guys who are waiting on the other stream that we are actually streaming here on, on this one. Um, I'm going to introduce Scott to you guys now. And while he introduces himself and talks a bit about himself, I'm just going to delete the other one to avoid further confusion. So uh, Scott, very, very welcome on my channel and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Willem. It's a pleasure, man. So, Scott, you actually have a blog and a Twitter account. I started following you on Twitter and some of the things that you said really resonated with me and made a lot of sense. And you also wrote in more detail about these things on your blog. Um, the title of the stream is one of the t uh, topics that you actually wrote about a lot, and that is the breakup of South Africa, why it is inevitable. And I think that's going to be an excellent topic to discuss on here. But yeah. before we start the discussion, will you please just uh, give a short introduction of who you are, where you come from, and why you went into political philosophy? Yeah, man. So um, I grew up in uh, the Drakensberg Mountains uh, of Natal which is on the east coast of uh, South Africa for all the non-South Africans up in uh, up on the border of Lesotho. And uh, I was uh, born in 1990, so right at the changeover of uh, the whole old South Africa into the new Rainbow Nation. And so I mm. grew up pretty much indoctrinated, just uh, like the rest of us. Um, you know, I was fully integrated at school, um, fully integrated uh, uh, my whole way going up sports teams, uh, everything you know so i was a i was a rainbow nation guy i was the liberal of liberals um you know i believed in south africa it was amazing like this place is the greatest the and, rainbow uh, nation I, the rainbow nation man i was i was all in hey and um i uh gave my life to jesus when i was probably about 13 and so the churches i was part of a, a huge part of the church uh, ethos really is to obviously encourage honor of the government, you know, so even more so it was like, guys, South, South Africa was this, I, I don't want to say an idol, but it was an idol. Like this, this multicultural mm. thing was, was this greatest object for us to, to be a part of. And so, um, I was a big socialist, you know, I, I believed that South Africa was great and that it, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't understand race. I didn't understand culture. I didn't understand tribe, tongue, land, mm. uh, how that all, all goes in. Um, and so, I, I, you know, probably by the end of high school and just as I started working as a young guy, a lot of the, the black guys I went to school with or church with started drifting uh, into Leninism. And uh, I, I just couldn't understand it. Eh? I was like, guys, like, how did this happen? Because, you know, in my, in my, my multicultural, uh, brain, <laughs> how can, how can this guy who I, I've gone to church with, I've gone to school with, I've played sports with, like, we know each other, like we we're friends. And so how could you drift off into Leninism and become super tribalistic, mm. become, uh, you know, that Pan-African tribalism 
Uh, and so what's the natural defense for that? This is, was really interesting. So I, I, I moved from being a, a, like a socialist or a liberal or, or I suppose what you would call a social democrat, maybe, I don't know. And I started drifting into libertarianism. Why? Because, well, there's scary people out there. And so if I just say that I'm a libertarian, that means I can run away from all of this stuff and just avoid it. Yeah, you, you know? just and leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. Exactly. But the but, actual but that, reality um, is that um, nobody's going to leave you alone if you're a libertarian. You're just making yeah. a weak target of yourself in order to, well, not be left alone. <laughs> exactly. And the biggest thing with, with libertarianism is it's because I had a fear. I, was, I, I had cowardice of not being able to take social ridicule, right? Because I'm, I'm part of churches, I'm part mm. of social groups where you've got to tow the party line. You've got to tow multiculturalism. You've got to tow... Uh, uh, progressivism or else you get kicked out rejected uh, all of that stuff so out of fear you become a libertarian because like like we were having a chat earlier libertarianism is the easy way mm. to mask having different views but but I'm not gonna like hey just leave me alone just leave me alone so I became a libertarian uh, and then uh, probably about five years ago I went uh, backpacking uh, in America and uh, I was going, uh, I was just doing some farm work and backpacking and, and just really enjoying the history of America. And uh, I was like, whoa, this place is amazing. Like for the first time in my life, I'm around my people, my culture. Um, you know, everyone speaks English. Pretty much everybody is uh, white. Pretty much everybody is Christian or at least Christian adjacent in morality. Mm. Uh, Christian you know, you culture. Don't have to lock your, Christian culture. You don't have to lock your doors at night. Uh, everyone uh, uh, obeys the customs and the the cultural norms, mm. uh, and if they don't, they're very quickly, you know, are policed back into what is the cultural norms. And I was like, this place is amazing, and so this thing in me of like, whoa, like this place is worth fighting for, and there became like the shedding of the libertarian mm. uh, uh, scales from my eyes because I was like. This place is worth fighting for. And I think like a nationalist spark was lit in my heart, you know, of like, man, like, I love my people. Mm. I love my culture. I love, I yes, love living and there's living nothing wrong with it. People. And there's nothing wrong with that. And so um, uh, I ended up marrying an American girl. And, uh, you know, so we were, we've been over there for, for four years now. And, um, you know, I, I, I very clearly understand now from a South African perspective where America is at, mm. you know, we are, we are 20 to 30 years ahead in South Africa of where America is going. Exactly. With this whole yes. democracy. Exactly. Yeah. And so my wife and I, we come back over, you know, every, every winter we try to come back over. So we came back two years ago. We've came back this winter. We came back in, well, summer now in South Africa, we came back in January uh, for three months and my three months is now indefinite with this whole lockdown thing. Um, and so basically, you know, being here, being with my family, just realizing how much I love this land and, uh, just the, the different perspective that coming from America back into South Africa, that's been the real drive behind my series of tweets and blog posts that I've, I've been doing is like, like guys, there's, there's, there's a, the, Afrikaners have a beautiful in-group preference. Mm. Us English boys, we struggle for in-group preference, you know, and, and I'm trying to say like, guys, it's okay to have our own culture. It's okay to enjoy our own culture. Like I, I respect every culture and I expect respect back, you know? Mm. So it, it's been a very huge progression from socialist to libertarian to now nationalist um, and kind of shedding off the fears uh, of being ostracized by the the pop culture. Well, culturally speaking, you are not you were not even you didn't even grow up in such a liberal culture. I mean, uh, I think back when I was at school, we used to play rugby against guys from Glenwood and Marysburg College and so forth. And yeah. you, I just want to mention the fact that you are a Natal boy. You're not a Cape Cape Town Englishman. And no. we as Afrikaners or as Boers really did resonate a lot more culturally with the with the guys from Natal because most of them are farm boys. Most of them also grew up in a kind of an agrarian culture. They it's usually culture, yeah. usually a lot more conservative, a lot more Christian as well. Whereas when you go to the Cape, it's just like hedonistic and 
anti-Christian and individualist and extremely liberal. So uh, for you to say that even your culture is liberal, which it was really liberal because Afrikaner culture is also probably at the most liberal point that it ever was in history. It just shows you how far we drifted. And you mentioned a very, very good point that um, South Africa is actually, the, the whites in South Africa is more liberal than any other whites um, in America that, you, that you've experienced. So that just shows yeah. you how we are still in this mindset of multiculturalism great. And that actually yeah. brings us to the point of this live stream, like why South Africa will e eventually fall and break down into small little countries like Yugoslavia did. So um, I actually made this argument first. You just said that it will break down, but I made the, the, the metaphor that it's a lot like Yugoslavia. So I just want to quickly explain to the audience what I meant by that before we get into the yeah. discussion. So in Yugoslavia, uh, you basically had a few tribes that were thrown together into a single country and they were made into a quote-unquote democracy in that single country where they all had to live together and um, cultural differences was being pushed aside for the greater good of the unitary state of Yugoslavia. And um, if that story sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly what happened in South Africa. After the British conquered most of South Africa, including the Zulu Kingdom and the Boer Republics and... Um, so on, they, they basically just said, okay, we want to have easy administrative access or administrative access. So we're just going to toss all of these together into one country called South Africa. But the difference yeah. between us and Yugoslavia is the, the culture of the Serbians and the Croatians and even to some extent yeah. the Bosnians are very close to each other. They are... Yeah biologically very close to each other they are culturally not that far apart but still the little bit of a cultural difference that there was caused so much friction that the country was basically became a bloodbath um like yeah. well south africa currently is if you look at the crime statistics it is a bloodbath here as well but um if you go to Croatia now, it's an absolutely great country. It's it's a it's a now a country for the Croatians, and it became a tourism hotspot. They've got great yeah. beaches there, great uh, architecture, great people, friendly people, and it's just so peaceful. And you, if you if you know the history of what happened in that particular country, just a few decades ago, you can't believe how peaceful it is in the in the country that was once the bloodbath of Europe. And um, I think the exact same thing can be said for South Africa. In South Africa, we have 11 different tribes who are yeah. at each other's throats all the time. Um, and they just they, there's just this hatred that is being spread here as propaganda, especially within the ANC. So the yeah. ANC, and this is the last point I'm going to make before we get into the discussion, the ANC is also a an example of a Yugoslavia because you have these factions inside it, the Zulu faction, yeah. like Zuma's faction. Then you've got the Reformer faction, which is Cyril's faction, which is basically everyone except the Zulus and the Corsas. And then you have the Corsa faction, which is the the South African Communist Party faction, those are like your Mandela, your Mbekis, the, the more radical communist ideologues who, who identify with that part, but it's actually just the Corsas against the Zulus. And they are at each other's throats as well. They are fighting like you wouldn't know inside yeah. the ANC. But the only thing that unites them is a common enemy. The only thing that unites them is a common cause, and this common cause is basically being an enemy of the white people, especially the Afrikaners. And um, we have seen that in, in Europe, for example, countries like the Holy Roman Empire uh, could exist and could exist peacefully for one reason alone, and that was because one th common uh, characteristic yeah. unify the people, and that was that they are all Christian, and that was not enough. The other part was that there needed to be a very strong common enemy, which was at that time the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. And that is exactly what you have in South Africa with the ANC. One thing unifies them, the fact that their skin color is black, even though their tribal and cultural differences are immense. And they've got this common enemy, which is white people, specifically Afrikaner. But that narrative is falling down 
that the Afrikaner is this huge threat. I know Sir Ramaphosa went on and he said that if you don't vote ANC, the Buddha, the Buddha will come back. And then he's this big fear mongering case of the Buddha, which is like the, the new Tokolossi. And if you don't go vote for the ANC, the Buddha will come back and they will absolutely obliterate you. But in any case, that, yeah. that, that lie is being is re um, less and less people believe it. So we, we all the more in a situation like Yugoslavia right here. And that's actually the yeah. metaphor that I try to use. But uh, Scott, tell us a bit about your own work. I know that you've got a blog. I actually linked the blog down in the description to this YouTube nice. video. But um, so if everyone, anyone wants to go read it afterwards, they're welcome to click on it. But tell us about your own work and why you also came to roughly the same conclusion on why South Africa will break up. Yeah, so my biggest, uh, my biggest mission, if you want to call it that, uh, has always been towards uh, the natural order with regards to masculinity, Christianity, and how it shapes society. You know, so I thought as a young guy, like, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant a church and I'm going to be a pastor. Like, that was one of my biggest things, you know. And then I was like, oh, maybe I should go into politics. Uh, you know, there's this, this kind of desire to help uh, groups of people get into what God has for them. What is God's heart for them? Mm. And so I really started with, with men where it was like, okay, like what is God's heart for man? You know, it's, it's to get married. It's to have children. It's to, uh, for an agrarian uh, example, it's to have your own piece of Eden, your own piece mm. of property and work your life work your surroundings in neighbor neighborhood in community with other men who are doing that uh and and to really bring the glory of god through marriage through family through property stewardship through business mm. through church through neighbors and i was like wow like that's amazing and and that's the very thing like you said in, in talking about yugoslavia that's under attack in the west you know so you the american media is the biggest perpetrator of this what do they destroy they destroy the the man they destroy marriage. They destroy family. They destroy church. They destroy neighborhood. They destroy uh, any form of the natural order. And so my, my biggest heart is, you know, it would be nice to go into politics. It would be nice to plant a church. But that's not where it starts. Those things are downstream from individual men sorting their life out exactly, into yes. God's natural way. So that, that's the heart of my blog. That's the heart of Twitter um, for me is I want to encourage men to win the cultural war. And, you know, that starts with simple things like getting out of debt. Because if you're in debt, the banks own you. Who owns the banks? It's the same people who own the media. They hate the natural order. And so they can control you through finances. You know, the next thing is, is like, are you going to get married and have children? The next thing is, are you going to... Uh, be a good neighbor and steward your land. Like all very practical things that a man can do. Mm. And if, you know, my, my heart is if 100,000 men can do this, we can save the West. We can, we can save Christian civilization. Um, and, and so part of that for me is this, uh, it's a terrible word, colonialism, because of all the propaganda mm. that has gone onto it. But when you think about colonialism, it's people from another kingdom or civilization going to another land and starting a duplicate society of the kingdom they came from mm. and so our role as christians is to colonize heaven onto earth like what are god's ways we're going to live that here and one of the things that always gives me uh, hope and encouragement Willem, is this this the propaganda is well unless you have a hundred thousand guys doing it, you're doomed. Unless you have a whole country doing it, you're doomed. And it's like, no, mm. like the colony that came to South Africa in, you know, 1700, 1600, the colony that went to America in the 1600s, that was like a hundred dudes and, mm. uh, and well, a hundred guys and their families, you know? And so we don't know the power of forming these small communities now and withstanding the waves of cultural hatred against little uh, communities of, like you said, of faith, uh, of tribe, um, of, of our culture. Like this is the culture we want to set up. Oh, there's only a hundred of us. Well, it's a long game. It's a, it's a multi-generational game. 
Well, if you if you look at the biblical where where the Bible mentions uh, what we in Afrikaans call the folk, uh, the folk, or what there's not really an English word for a folk, um, like the way that is meant in Afrikaans. But your the, your ethnic group, the the Greek word is actually ethnos. The Greek word ethnos actually just means extended family. So your people, your your folk, like me as an Afrikaner means that it's just my extended family and uh, what does God say in the Bible is look after your family and that that includes your extended family and I just yeah. want to mention something that really resonated with me was when you said that you first wanted to become a pastor and then you went into politics but once you once you start getting into really really studying the Bible and really studying what God says in the Bible to a people you realize that 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 the Bible was never written for an individual that is a very liberal interpretation but never ever does the Bible ever talk to an individual it, it always it's always a message from God to people and I think that's also something that we can we can uh, we can bring into uh, relation with the whole situation in South Africa is we have all these different cultures and, um, and specifically the Africana culture we came here because we wanted to practice our religion um, yep. just for like I, I just want to take a minute to to talk about the the history of the 40 years war in the Netherlands so yep. so um, the Netherlands which is where the Africana most of the Africana come from was at war with Spain because Spain was actually in control of the Netherlands and Spain was a Catholic nation. And then Spain started to bring in all these draconian religious laws where it says that you had to be Catholic, otherwise you would get basically be hanged. Um, the same way that they went into South America and did the exact same thing by hanging people who didn't want to become Catholic. And then Prince Willem van Oranje stood up and said, no, but we are Dutch. We are not a Catholic nation. We are a reformed nation. We are a Calvinist nation. And then there was this massive war. And um, at the same time, this exact same thing happened in France and in Germany, where people who believed in Calvinism were uh, prosecuted by the Catholic Church. And that's why most people came to South Africa. The real reason why most Afrikaners came to South Africa was to establish exactly what you said, this country in which we can live out our own culture. That culture being a, a Christian culture and a Calvinist culture. And that culture yeah. is just, if you, if you look at politics of today in South Africa, modern politics, it's just so radically different from anything that you will hear from the DA, anything you'll hear from yeah. the ANC, anything you'll hear from the EFF, that you just start to see that it is impossible for to get along. And I think we actually just in the in the first stages of uh, the real tearing apart of South Africa, um, I think we're going to start seeing it rapidly becoming worse now because the ANC is bankrupt and the ANC's infighting is reaching a new peak with this coronavirus yeah. crisis. The coronavirus uh, lockdown that the ANC decided on is absolutely destroying the economy. And once we hit rock bottom and once there's nothing left to hold on to, um, materialist, materialistically wise, um, people are starting to go, go back to their roots and uh, people are starting to, to uh, go back to who their people is and... Yeah. Um, people will start to become much more in-group preference and people will start yeah. to stand up for their own again once they see that the idea of a rainbow nation is a f fictitious idea which can only be created in the minds of intellectuals um, yeah. but was never ever implemented in or could never be implemented in the real world. I, I it's one against of, the natural order. Exactly. One yeah. of my one of my friends said that, you know, liber liberalism is a an ideology which has little faults on paper but has many faults when implemented into the real world while something like communitarianism or nationalism is something that has a lot of faults when impl when you, you look at it on paper and when you interpret history in a way that suits liberalism where they basically yeah. blame all the the bad things and the wars on a yeah. feeling of communitarianism um yeah. And it's actually something that works. Um, yeah. 
if you look at a, a country like like um, Switzerland, is probably one of the best countries to take as an example of a country that always had nationalist communitarianism, uh, without having an imperialist or an expansionist uh, uh, idea to it. Yeah. And I think if we want to strive to something, and if we want to strive to something that is also very close to our culture. We have to look at, at Switzerland because Switzerland and the whole legal system and political system in Switzerland is also built almost entirely on Calvinist theology. And exactly. that's very, very close to what the Afrikaner yeah. is. And then so, again... Well, let me jump in on that yeah. because that, that's a big thing there. When you ask, all right, what are God's ways? You know, because a lot of Christians will be like, yeah, Scott, you know, multiculturalism is God's purpose. Like, you know, everyone must must worship jesus together and uh you know there's no there's no uh race in the spirit and blah 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 all these things that they would use against having homogenous in-group preference there there's this huge uh logical mind trap where people think democracy equals goodness democracy mm. equals righteousness you know, even even the fact that communism is OK, like we have a communist ruling party, like no one thinks like, oh, you know, anyway. So they'll go, you know, Scott, you have to honor this government. You have to honor the new South Africa. You have to pray for it. Let's unite. Let's let's get behind South Africa. And it's like, OK, let's let's flip this around. Was it OK for Mandela to protest apartheid because he was he did not honor the government? But then they say, oh, but Scott, apartheid was evil, you know, or uh, whatever. I'm trying to think the American Revolution, right? Uh, it, George Washington should have honored the English mm. king. Willem von Warane should, should have, have honored the Spanish king. Should have honored the Spanish king. Mm. And so what you get is this, this logical uh, blindness where people are like, well, OK, if it's not, if it's not like I, I can grant you that, yes, Mandela uh, should not have uh, protested against apartheid, except, and here's where their true motive comes out, except that it was the Afrikaners who were in government. Afrikaners are evil and mm. black people are not evil. And so therefore black people are allowed to pro protest white people. That's the logic. They, 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 they don't say that, but that's the logic that's happening. It's exactly, it's exactly and, is. And so when I say with, with South Africa, with this whole lockdown, it hasn't been a shock. To, I'm, I've been angry, but I'm not shocked. Because when you look at who our ruling party is, they're a Leninist party. What is what is the objective? You can go read their manuscripts. You can go read their manifestos. It's all in plain sight. We were never taught to read communist material growing up in the schools because that would explain their game plan. Here's the game plan of Leninism. To have two classes in a country, the poor and the political elite who look after the mm. poor. The middle class is your enemy. Like you were saying earlier, you have to have a joint enemy. And so in South Africa, the enemy is the middle class. And who is the middle class? 80% white, you know? And so what is the purpose of the lockdown? It's to, it's to reduce this middle class, increase the poor class. And then they've always been talking about this uh, expropriation of land without compensation. Now, that would make them look bad in the eyes of the international community. Mm. So what is this virus doing? It's making the middle class go bankrupt. The banks reap all of their assets, all of their land, all of their businesses, and then the political elites bail out the banks by buying those assets. You've just expropriate. Not it's happening in the next couple of months. There'll be, I'm sure, there'll be a ton of foreclosures, a ton of bankruptcies, and who's going to buy those middle class assets? It's going to be the political elite. Mm. And it's and interesting so now, to just mention that I read most of the lockdown rules in most of the major countries in the world and South Africa's lockdown regulations are by far worse than any other country in the world. Where they, where by, by, for instance, the only country in the world where there's such exceptionally draconian regulations put on trade and where you can't buy cigarettes or alcohol and stuff like that. Yes. Mm. Yep, it's ridiculous. And, and I'd even go further to say, you know, probably about January, well, I just arrived back in South Africa in January. So let's call it February. You know, I hadn't experienced load shedding for two years. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, load shedding. Like what intonation is going on? And, you know, load shedding is not a economic issue. South Africa has the budget. We have the expertise. You know, it's not as if the people who are in ESCOM don't know 
they don't have a book that says, here's how you run the power grid. Mm. They have that. And they have the money to be able to bring in any German, any old Afrikaner, any Chinese technician to come and keep the grid up. Yeah, they don't even have to bring anyone in. We have some of the best engineers in the world right here. It's not, it's the, um, and this is my allegation. It's not a money issue. It's not an infrastructure issue. They want the middle class gone. What does the middle class want? Law and order, working infrastructure, peace. That's all we want. We just want peace, law and order. Let us carry on with our businesses. Let the lights carry on. And so they're like, how do we frustrate the middle class? Switch the lights off for six hours a day. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And the other uh, thing is that you didn't mention about ESCOM is the fact that it is a country, I mean, a company with a monopoly on a service that every single person in the country use. So there's no way on earth that you cannot make profit with a company like that. That's like saying, that's like saying I, it's almost like saying I, I own all of the water in this country and I sell it to everyone. Is there any way that I'm not going to make a profit selling water? Well, that's actually, I actually just described something else that the state (laughs) does actually sell. And but you're also hitting a really good picture because how do I, kill the middle class i uh cut off their water mm. you know but, but that would be that would be terrible again the international community would be like oh my gosh they're killing people it's like no let's turn off their lights and eventually they're going to want to leave or their businesses are going to close or you know it's it's that whole boil the frog slowly thing of how do we get this middle class to leave and unfortunately that middle class is 80 percent white you know so that's where the racism issue comes in Mm. yeah that's and and also it's a very it's a much more populist narrative to follow because black people are allowed to make remarks against other races because they are seen as this eternal victim group so that's where this massive race populist issue comes in where you have basically the exact same narrative that you would have in a normal leninist society but you just strengthen the narrative way more by not uniting the middle class, I mean, the, the, the underclass or the working class against the middle class, but the black people against the white people. And then you speak to people's human nature because uh, cooperation on the basis of genetic similarity in sociology is by far the most common and most uh, strongest instinct that we as human beings have is to yeah, to, to cooperate with people who look like you co- cooperate with people who are family or extended family of you cooperate yeah. with people who um you know is close to the same as you uh yeah. actually uh, an example of this how the the psych- psychology works is when i think it was planet of the, of the apes like the first planet of the apes was there was no cgi so all of these apes that were fighting humans had to be actual humans who were who they put a lot of makeup on and they um they you know they they went through hours of makeup just to to make a, a person look like an orangutan or a chimpanzee or a gorilla or whatever and what they found out was very very interesting they went through the pictures afterwards was the fact that the the orangutans sat with the other orangutans and ate with the other orangutans the chimpanzees sat with the other chimpanzees the gorilla sat with the other gorillas and it just shows you these are people who probably they they extras actors on a on a movie and um it's just so so uh deeply ingrained in your psychology to be to be part of your group that the people self-segregated themselves into species which they didn't they were not even and um if you if you actually read your bible and you read about the the two greek words the oikos and the ethnos which the bible says look after uh the bible says a, a person who can't who can't look after or a man sorry let me let me rephrase that a man yes. who can't look after his family or even his extended family is worse than an infidel and if you look at the yep. two greek words there it, it uses the word oikos for family and it, then it wo- uses the word ethnos for extended family and then it's, it says that 
if you can't look after your family or your ethnic group, which is your folk, then you are a horrible person, basically. Yeah. And and here's another that's... here's another one jumping in on that. Mm-hmm. Another argument that a lot of Christians, liberal Christians, use is the Good Samaritan. You know, like, hey, but Scott, you know, you're such a racist. But didn't you read about the the Good Samaritan? Here's the story about the Good Samaritan, right? So the he, yeah, they were totally despised each other. It was like, like saying a, a Muslim and a Chinaman, mm. like two totally disparate ethnicities. The Samaritan, or two totally disparate faiths. The Samaritan, he didn't take the Jew and then take him back to his home. And then the Jew ended up living in his home for the next 10 years, getting married, having children in his home. And then, mm. you know, being part of his family. For the, It's like, no, he took him to a Jewish innkeeper and said to the Jewish innkeeper, here is your brother. I'm going to give you money out of the charity of my own heart to look mm. after your brother. Uh, when I come back, we'll check if he's okay. And I'm going to go on with my life. Exactly. And yes. so the biggest guilt trip laid on the Christian West is that you've got to take everybody into your home. You've got to give them access to your fridge, access to your daughter's bedroom, access to your car, access to your bank account. And if you don't, you're not being a good Samaritan. And it's like, guys, like, that's madness. You know, if I had to share my wife with everyone, she wouldn't be my wife. Exactly. If I had to, if I had to take you know, 30 other kids into my home and treat them all the same as my kid, then my kid stops being my kid. And you Um, you can make the exact same arguments, economically speaking, by saying if everybody's rich, then nobody's rich. So trying to give everybody a lot of money will just uh, inevitably make everyone poor. Yeah, inflation, because it'll inflate everything. Mm, Exactly, yes. So coming back to to democracy and South Africa and all of this stuff, you know, there's this, there's this uh, worship of an unnatural ideal of the rainbow nation. And, you know, the worst perpetrators of it are the white, mostly English, but call it the urban. Because the agrarian mm. English, like you said, are, are an adjacent culture to the Afrikaners. And there's also urbanized Afrikaners, liberal Afrikaners. Yes. So here's the deal, right? Here where I live... I was born in an area where the tribe, the local tribe here is the Amangwane. They are, uh, if you go and say to someone, hey man, like, who are you? What, what are you? And you'll be like, I'm Amangwane. Then I'm a Zulu. Then I'm South African. You go and ask an Indian, hey man, like, what are you? I'm an Indian. Then I'm a South African. Mm. You go and ask an Afrikaner, I'm a Boer. Then I'm a South African. You go and ask a Tosta, I'm a Tosta. Then I'm a South African. You go ask a liberal Englishman. No, I'm, I'm South African, man. South Africa first, South Africa, everything. And it's actually a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a symptom of our socialized liberal thinking where we think that we're still part of the empire. And so us Brits, us Englishmen still control the, the South African empire. So the, I am South African because the South African empire is still rightfully mine. You know, we have this natural... Uh, liberal uh, uh, idiocy where we are both think that, that everyone else, we call everyone else equal to us, but yet we still call ourselves South African because we, have, we are going to control the empire. Mm. And it's like, dude, you, you were kicked out of controlling the empire back in 1948 and you've ever since then, you've just made excuses uh, to not integrate with uh, what's really going on, what the real life stuff is going on. Like, I'm not a Zulu because I was born in, in Zululand. I'm not a Mangwane. Like, I can go live with them and honor them. I can learn the language. I can honor their culture. You know, I can convert to, to ancestral worship. But like you just said, they're all going to look at me and they're going to say, Omlungu, he's different to us. Mm. And, and I'm fine with that. I'm not offended. I'm not offended by them calling me that. I'm not offended by them, uh, you know, not including me on the in-group preference of course i'm different um you know and and i made this this argument to a a friend of mine we were chatting and i said let's say i moved to israel right i love the i love the i love the picture of israel because they've got they've got shared ethnicity jews are very big on ethnicity they've got shared faith Mm. and then they've got shared land and shared language with hebrew so they've got the four cultural things very strong 
in group preference. If me, a, a, a Anglo Protestant uh, from a different land and I speak English, all four are wrong. But let's say I moved there and I started a business. Mm. After a year, you come and ask me, hey, Scott, how's your business going? I'm going to be like, these guys are so racist. No one buys from me. They shun me. They don't invite me to synagogue. No one allows me the in-group pricing of the cousin gets the deal. Like, this place sucks and they hate me. Exactly. That's yes. not their fault. They're not racist. There's That's nothing. Not there's fault. absolutely it's nothing wrong fault. with it. It's my fault for going there and expecting to be treated like an in-group preference Individual, yes. You know? And so it's the same as this, this crazy South African empire of different cultures where it's like you've got an Indian business, you've got a Zulu business, you've got an English business, you've got an Afrikaans business. I, as an Englishman, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to have a language barrier with those two guys, with the Indian and the, and the Englishman. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose their two businesses. And between the two, I know that the Indian guy is going to uh, do different business differently to the, the English guy. And I probably went to school with the English guy. I probably know his cousin and but i'm gonna go do business with the english guy well actually not you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna logically say inside your mind all of the things you mm -hmm. just said to me it's just gonna come naturally yeah. and you're just gonna exactly, go to your mate store that to the people yeah. who don't understand like why i didn't choose the indian guy mm. why i didn't choose the afrikaans guy why i didn't choose the zulu guy it's not because i hate them i in fact i you know i respect all races i want people to respect me I want people to reciprocate that respect for me. And that's exactly um, something that you can see happening in South Africa all the time. This idea of boss cup or what do they call it? Boss ship in English. I don't even know what, what boss cup is called in English, but where they, where they claim that, you know, wherever you go, you, you might have like a, a hardware store or a grocery store, or whatever. And then you ha would have all the people cleaning the floors and you would have the people sitting behind the, um cashiers and all of them would be black and then you would have like two or three managers and they they would usually be three would usually be like um young white or mostly afrikaans guys and then yep. they they claim all all of this racist things and they look like yeah you know blacks are being kept oppressed uh by the white people and that white people have it in for black people or if you go to let's let's just name one more example you have a construction company and there's the the contractor and he's white and then there's a foreman and he's also white and then you've got all the blacks being laborers and then this young white guy comes in he has no experience in construction but then he comes in and he is being employed as a foreman and then they would use that as an example of racism being uh, perpetuated towards blacks because there were some of these black people that worked for him for five years or for 10 years and they are not made a foreman and then this young white kid comes in and he's being made a foreman but the the part that they don't understand is that young white kid that just came into the business is probably the owner's cousin it's probably it's probably the owner's son's friend from school um that maybe you and know studied something in this, in it and let's flip this example on its head hmm. Willem. let's say it's a it's a black company with white laborers black foreman black owner all right and let's say let's say that a, a young black guy comes in and he has no experience and he gets made to be the boss over me and i've been laboring there for five years that's still okay like it's not um mm. it's not it's not my right to now be a foreman over who the boss chooses it's the boss's business he can choose what he wants and then the second thing let's say the boss deals with mainly black uh clients mainly black bank mainly black suppliers do i does he now who all speak zulu does he now want this white boy who can't speak zulu to be a foreman now i'm trying to make phone calls to the bank to get financing I, they can't understand me. I need an interpreter. Now I'm trying to go hmm. to a client to have lunch with a client, but now I don't understand the culture. I don't, I don't eat this food. I don't know that I'm supposed to leave my jacket off or on or, and now I lose the client, the business client. Like there's cultural realities that, that people just can't hmm. accept in a multicultural uh, uh, empire. And so this is where it gets really, where democracy gets really evil. 
and people need to understand this democracy is evil democracy is not god's natural order mm. so what happens here in democracy in a multiracial democracy we all we all stick together because we've got to protect our our own interests right so whoever has 50 plus 1 vote gets to implement their culture on all the rest exactly it's just it's just mob rule it's just mob rule. Major, majoritarianism and what is god's way right so god's way is property boundaries like god's way is the garden of eden like hey man this is your piece of land this is your piece of land don't kill each other please don't kill each other how do you make them not kill each other you put a fence between them and then he owns this piece he owns this piece how do you make them kill each other you say you put you have three guys you take all the fences away and you say all right you guys now get to vote how we use this whole big piece mm. and that's how you kill each other you know it's um, two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner exactly and so in yugoslavia mm. what what ended up happening there is you had three different faiths you had catholics you had orthodox and you had muslims mm. and they were all the same pretty much ethnicity so ethnicity wasn't the problem it was faith right and but even happened, even between some of the people who are of the same faith like the serbians and the and the croatians they also had a massive fight between them yeah and so what happened there the the croatians wanted independence from that empire so they declare they make a udi they declare independence but now the problem was croatia was uh 78 percent croatian and the rest were almost all serbian so there was a huge serbian minority in croatia and they were like no we don't want to be ruled by croatia we want back with the, our serbian guys mm. and that's was some of the fighting same with with bosnia right or uh, herzegovina whatever it was called mm. something like 20 or 30 percent serbians in bosnia and something like 20 or 30 percent croatians in bosnia and so the bosnians only had like a 10 or 20 percent majority so both of them start fighting the bosnians mm. you know like there's this, there's this in-group thing of like if we're going to do democracy i'm going to fight you over it and, exactly, and Yugoslavia, yes. Yugoslavia was a hot war, right? Guns came out, tanks came out. And um, the, right now in South Africa, we've got a Cold War. And what are the, the weapons of democracy in a Cold War? It's the media, because if you, can, if you can do propaganda and have a monopoly on propaganda, you get to say who the bad guy is. And in a democracy, if you're the bad guy, no one votes for you. Mm. The next thing is uh, the schools, education, college, academia. Uh, if you can control the schools, you can teach them again. Who's the bad guy? And so no one's going to vote for you. Uh, the next uh, thing is birth rate, right? So if you look at birth rates, that, that's my biggest encouragement to Western Christian men. Like I'm, my wife and I are praying for lots of kids. Please, you know, please, if you're a white Christian man, have as many kids as you can because it's democracy. It's open war by birth rate. You know, it's who shows up at the next generation. And so birth rate becomes a huge thing. If you look at, if you look at the birth rate uh, statistics of South Africa, back in 1912, I think it was something like four to one uh, Africans to whites. Um, and they just, they won the democratic birth war, you know. Well, it's not just birth. We have to remember that there was a lot of migration from all uh, over that, Africa to South Africa yeah. as well during apartheid. Everyone wanted, everyone hated apartheid, but everyone in the whole continent of Africa be. wanted to live under apartheid rather than they wanted to live exactly. under that's, whatever other that's country. That's the next weapon of, of democracy is immigration, mm. you know. And that's exactly what you're saying about South Africa is what's happening in America. It's simultaneously the most hated country on earth because it's racist and evil mm. And, and Christians are evil. And it's simultaneously the country that all of these people want to move to. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's, it's racist and evil because of the propaganda being spread about it. But it's also the country that everyone wanted to move to because the countries that are being propagated as good African countries are absolute horrible nightmares to live in. If, oh, if we look at what the ANC or actually the presidency uh, tweeted on their Twitter today. Let me let me just quickly um, get that 
on the screen so people can see it. But any case, so so I actually let me just uh, move that there, and I've got then I can move Twitter to this screen, and I can show people I actually tweeted about this. Um, it was just a few back here. There we go. Look at this. So the presidency in South Africa has this thread here where it names all of its heroes. This is the specific tweet that I talked about. And it's it's labeled the Africa we want. Celebrating yeah. the founding of the African Union on the 25th of May 1963. Hashtag Africa Day. Hashtag the Africa we want. Hashtag Africa response. Hashtag stronger together. And then he's got this huge picture of Robert Mugabe. And it says Africa is for Africans. And um, so they, the, the presidency in South Africa and, um, uh, and the ANC in particular has this absolute idolisa idolization of Robert Mugabe because everything that the ANC believes in and everything that the ANC is fighting for is the th are the things that Mugabe actually implemented. And he, um, he, and he actually he achieved it, yeah. And then we, we, we lie to ourselves and we say, you know, democracy, rainbow nation, etc. And nothing like Zimbabwe is going to happen. While the literal people who are governing over us are going onto public platforms like Twitter and literally telling everybody in advance that they want to be like Mugabe. The Africa we, we want. want South Africa to become Zimbabwe. We want South Africa to move toward what Zimbabwe is. Yes, and have you have you ever, since you started reading the news, have you ever in your entire life heard anyone from the ANC or the EFF say anything negative about Robert Mugabe? No. That's exactly the thing. Even even though his people starved, even though he was yeah. objectively possibly the worst leader for black people that black people could ever have because he basically starved his country to death. He's still the idol. And because he destroyed the middle class, which is the Leninist goal. Mm. Because and, and so I, I took your tweet and, and I, I tweeted after that. So I said, 1980 to 2000, Zimbabwean nationalists kick out the European farmers and businessmen, sending them across the border. 2000 mm. to 2020. Millions of liberated Zimbabweans, and then I put in brackets starving, mm. follow the Europeans over the border to beg to work for them again. And that's one of the biggest things with, with Zimbabwe that a lot of people don't understand is that the middle class in Zimbabwe had somewhere to run to, right? So they all ran to South Africa. The country collapses. South Africa is now, they want to pursue Zimbabwean policies, and they are. That's what they're doing. The problem is, South Africa has a captive middle class, right? We're, we're hemorrhaging middle class people at, what, 100,000 a year? I don't know how many are, are immigrating. But they can't just pick up their, their, their trailer and, and move across the border. So they're captive here because it's too much of, an, of a... So we have a slow puncture in South Africa. We've still got, what, 4 million middle class left. Uh, and that's what's keeping the ship... Like, the ship has gone down, but there's an air bubble. And the air bubble is keeping the ship above water. Hmm. But there's a leak in the air bubble, you know. So what is stopping Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwefication of South Africa, is a captive middle class. It's an air bubble, yeah. That's a very, you know? very and good this, metaphor. This lockdown is, is it's, that's why they're all loving this lockdown because it's a, it's a speeding up, it's an amplification of getting the middle class out of here. Because I, right now, I'll tell you, after this lockdown ends, Businesses are going to be going under. People are going to be bankrupt. And why would you want to start again here in this economy? You you far rather better, even going across the border to Mozambique, like, hey, there's some gas and mineral stuff happening in Mozambique. Like, if I'm going to start again, I might as well go try there. Or, you know, Zambia and Angola are wanting farmers. Like, I'm going to go there. But you're not going to start again mm. in South Africa. Exactly, you're 100% right. And Afrikaner farmers, a lot of them have moved to Zambia and they're doing exceptionally well there because the, the soil is just so fertile, it rains a lot. But um, the question is just, you know, the Zambian government is currently so friendly of the white people because they, the people who are there, the generation who are there, grew up in a milieu where, um, where, where they didn't have food 
and they yep. had famine and then these Afrikaner farmers who were actually excellent farmers came in they 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 got huge farms that they actually loaned from the government because you're not allowed to own property in Zambia only the government owns property but in any case so they loaned this this huge pieces of land from the government for a reasonable price and they producing a lot of food but yeah. the next generation doesn't know what the previous generation knew about the famine all they see is a, a country where there is plenty and and then they see that the most of the plenty is in the hand are. of the farmers and now they start blaming the farmers for it because now they start calling the farmers land thieves and that is yes. exactly what happened in south africa so they're just a, a generation behind us the Afrikaner oh, yeah. farmers that went to zambia and the yep. problem here is the fact that that's how, how it always will be when you have got one sorry one group that's more privileged than the other group yeah yeah exactly and, and I'd, I'd like to make a distinction here as well Willem, of if you look at this Leninist model of having a political elite, no middle class, and then all the rest of the people are the poor class. What a lot of people have to understand is that a lot of uh, black people are not antagonistic to white people. It's the political elite who are propagandizing and inciting and telling stories and pointing people to be angry at the whites. And so one of the big things I say you know, as far as a solution going forward is let's say right now, you know, the two, the two groups that have the, the biggest chance of ever doing anything, the Cape, the Cape mm -hmm. secessionists and maybe the Zulus, the Zulu kingdom, because both have a infrastructure over a geographical location. So if you look at the Yugoslav war, Serbia had a huge, big infrastructure and they had, uh, they had the ability to project power into Bosnia and into Croatia. But if Serbia was gone, those Serbians stuck in those, those two countries, they did not have geographical government infrastructure mm. that they could project power from, right? So what we have in South Africa, we don't have any neighbors to project power into South Africa for the Afrikaner or for the Englishman or for the Indian, right? There is no chance of that. What we do have is two geographical areas that have a government infrastructure that is not run and owned by the ruling party, mm. by the empire. And that's the Cape and it's the Zulus who have a royal family. Now, the biggest issue we have, right? Zulus, they've, they've got it great, right? The, the royal king, he owns 30, 35%, 33% of KwaZulu-Natal's land mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, and he's getting huge amounts of tax money every year from the government. That's, they've bought his loyalty, right? Mm -hmm. He's happy. He's not going to do anything, right? So that's him kind of out of the question. That takes us to the Cape, right? Now, the Cape... Here's the biggest issue with the Cape is that they are civic nationalists. They're well, most of them are actually full-on liberals. There's a small group of civic nationalists who want to succeed the Cape. Yes. And so the biggest issue there is let's say that they had the balls to declare independence, right? To say, we're going to declare independence over this geographical area. We've already got the government infrastructure. Here's the problem is they, they are not dealing, like you said, most of them are liberals. And mm. at best, most of them are civic nationalists. Some of them are civic nationalists. The problem is you're not addressing the very problems you're trying to escape from this big empire. Mm. And so, unfortunately... You're just creating case, a small empire that is a, a small mirror image of the, exactly. the current South African empire, if you put it like that. And it's going to mirror the Serbian thing because they've now got a huge big country next door to project power into their geographical area. Mm. So the ANC will just become a liberation movement again in the Cape, liberating all these poor people exactly, from these yes. evil white supremacist it's like people. it's like swap with southwest uh, africans people's organization which liberated the people in south africa 
um, but yep. from another country. I just want to quickly yep. mention Graham. He gave a 50 rand super chat saying this is the best uh, interview he's ever heard or he's heard. I think that's what he means. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Graham. The words there means a lot and uh, even a lot more than the money. It's, it's really good. Um, but any case, Scott, I think we've been on just for over an hour now. Um, I, I usually try to keep my streams short is so yeah. people can go watch them afterwards so i think let's let's give 10 minutes more for uh people to ask questions and like to that. um and to give comments on so we can we can involve the people watching as well so i'll, I'll look out for that i see there are 922 people watching the stream um rooster says it's the th it's the thumbs up yeah, if you want to do that, and also if you if you find the content here interesting and you haven't subscribed yet, click on that subscribe button, and also click on the little bell icon so you can get the notifications. Um, but Scott, the I have to say this conversation that you and I had was absolutely, uh, it was it was really great. It was probably one of the best interviews yeah. I've had. Probably. Uh, one of the deepest interviews I've had on this channel. Um, and I've interviewed everyone from the EFF to, you know, people on the DA and people from yeah. all different walks. And I think what your message is just really, really, um, it just resonates with a lot of people. And I've seen it from the chat here. I've seen they usually people in the chat are, they don't agree with the speaker and then they would make it clear. But I, I, I've, kind of followed the chat here while we were while we were talking while you were talking and I, I didn't see any negative comments towards what we did great guns yeah just give it gave a five dollar super chat said a uh, great program and guest so um it was it was really really great and uh also okay. people are saying yeah we need a second interview with scott um that'll definitely happen we can we can really we can really do this we can make this a regular thing because yeah, I, like I, I, I you, you really um i like your intellect i like your ideas you 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 really come across well a uh, high verbal iq uh, all of that stuff so um thank you very much for for this um it looks like the people in the chat yeah well, most of them just say second interview pre please and so on um there's not so much uh i i don't see much questions or any questions for for that matter but in any case um scott uh, so i'll just i'll just end this off right here um yeah. and thank you very very much for coming onto the stream it was really yeah, sure. as i said it was a great stream and thank you very much for everyone who uh contributed to the chat and um who watched this with us and uh yeah uh, goodbye to you and goodbye to you scott and god bless every one of Thanks you yeah, bless you bro